us, we will um, we'll get started talking about, um, and I hopefully everybody will listen to this because I have some pretty good uh, words uh, that will help you in uh, negotiating uh, some things, some questions specifically that we should talk to buyers about when we're on the phone talking to them. This, this is from some old stuff. I was looking through some, some information that I have uh, putting together the uh, course that starts next week on uh, equity buyouts and foreclosures. And I found uh, a, an article from 1988, six questions every buyer of houses should ask. Um, let me just kind of go through these things. It's surprising after 30, I guess that's what, 33 years ago, some of this stuff is still exactly the same. It's exactly what you want to do. Um, number one question to make sure that you get answered from the buyer, from the seller, excuse me, why is the seller selling this lovely house? We've talked about uh, in word hacks that bring stacks, um, how do you go about doing that? You can ask them things like having them describe, open, open-ended questions, having them describe the house um, and tell you about you know, what they think of it, you know, bedrooms, bathrooms, how big it is, condition, uh, you know, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, the neighborhood, that type of thing. And then you ask them, unless it's an obvious trash pit, uh, junk, teardown type thing, it's a dump. You ask them, you know, uh, why in the world would you ever want to sell this lovely house? They'll open up and tell you at that point when you do that, the uh, you know, what they've got on their mind, you know, what their true motivation is, what, and they'll tell you, you know, the real truth at that point, whether it's, hey, we're going to, uh, you know, going to move to Hawaii, or, uh, you know, I've got to uh, go get the COVID shot in seven states over, or I'm moving to be near my grandkids, or, or whatever. Um, that's, that's probably my number one question to get answered by these sellers of these houses is you know why they're selling because that that will really help you in terms of the motivation most people love to tell stories so they'll be more than happy to talk about what they've got going on number two and it's one i've totally forgot about i used when i first got started but i haven't used it lately i'm trying to fix my camera here um how much did you pay for the house we always ask how much do you owe on the house but a good question to ask is how much you paid for the house. In addition to, you know, if you're talking to them about terms, you're going to want to get to the information about how much they owe on the house. The reason that you want to find how much they paid for the house, because anybody who's owned the house for any period of time will have enough equity in it that that will give you a gauge from which to, uh, you know, to base it. And most people remember what they paid for a house. So you got a house, you're talking to somebody today. They're wanting 400, they think it's worth 460, it needs 20 of work. Um, you're gonna have to give them the bad news that you're not gonna pay anything close to 400 on a house that needs 20 of work and it's only worth 460 afterward if it's a cash purchase, if you can't get them going on a, um, a seller finance thing. But what you can do is you can say, okay, well, what did you pay for the house? It's public information and they shouldn't be afraid to give you that. Um, and, and maybe I'll send the six questions all buyers should ask out to everybody so you guys can read what I'm reading. But um, it's a good question because it will get them thinking, okay, I only paid 100000 for that house 22 years ago, and I'm asking 400 now. It's a lot easier for them to mentally go from 400 down to 100 or someplace in between, actually closer to 400 than 100. But when they start verbalizing that stuff, when it comes out of their mouth, and they start thinking in terms of, yeah, you know, I really, I bought it for a hundred. I'm looking for 400. Uh, you know, that 300 is really phantom money. I mean, we've seen the market on houses go up and down, you know, two years ago that, or 10 years ago, that house that's now today, 460 in value, probably was 260 or 180 or something like that. And they had still made a ton of money when they bought it at a hundred at the 180 mark. So it will make it a lot easier when you got to negotiate for a better cash price, um, not necessarily for terms, but even for terms as well, to not only ask them what they owe, but what they paid for the house. Um, and you know, how long have you owned it? And what'd you pay, by the way, for the house? And they'll, they're, a lot of times they'll brag about it. Now, it'll also tell you if somebody's wanting 400 and they bought the house two years ago at 380, there's probably no room for them uh, to negotiate much. 
And there is room for you to negotiate. You could get it subject to at 380 instead of 400. So it works whether you're going to do a cash deal or you're going to do a terms deal or subject to type transaction with these folks by getting them to verbalize that information. In one case, in the case of somebody wanting all cash, it helps you to lower the cash price you're going to offer. In the case of um, where you're going to buy it subject to, um, it tells you that they really don't have much to, to worry about there. I mean, they're going to be walking away from 20000 and if they were to try and sell it on the market, it would cost them you know, up to 10% for commissions and closing costs on a 400000 sale. That would put them at 360 They owe 380 They're going to be upside down. So it would be very easy to talk them in from a, they want 400 cash to, why don't you just sell it subject to for 380 and I'll give you $2,000 moving money. So it's a, it's a great question to ask. Um, and you can get more, uh, more information from that standpoint and, and more ammo that'll be better for you when you do your negotiations. We were looking around in um, Huntington Beach. We were walking a neighborhood and we spotted a house that looked like it was original from the 50s or 60s. We look it up and the same guy owned it. He bought it, I think it was like 1960. He paid, I think it was 22000 the house is worth about eight hundred thousand now. Probably six fifty in the condition it was in, or five fifty, something like that. But that obviously tells you, okay, this guy's got all this equity in that house. There's there was no other lien since then, you know. And if you were to ask that question, okay, you want six fifty? How much did you pay for it? Oh, I bought it way back in nineteen sixty for twenty two thousand. Okay, so you're going to make a profit. Let me do the math here. That would be six hundred. And twenty-eight thousand dollars profit. Is that what is that what that looks like at six fifty? Okay, all right. So you can use that, and it'll always help you negotiate. Now there are four more good questions, but I've already used up my allotted time. So I think I'm going to divide the other four questions uh, two on to next Tuesday, and then maybe two for next Thursday. But there's some other really good questions that uh, that you can ask. Some of them you already asked, but there's a different slant on how to ask them. So that's, uh, you know, hacks, uh, word hacks that bring big stacks. Let me talk a little bit about foreclosures because we've got this big foreclosure clinic starting next week. And that is all the press today is what's going on in the foreclosure world out there. And California in particular has had something really unique happen. The state legislature and, we're, you know, we're goofy as hell here in California. We do all kinds of stuff. Um, we passed a, a bill, Senate, California Senate Bill 1079. California Bill 1079 basically put a 45-day de delay on foreclosure auctions so that, get this, so that the city or county can put a bid in that would get a priority bid over the regular auction process. So it, it's amazing. It's basically like the government coming in and saying, I get first shot at this commercial contract without anybody else uh, being able to interfere or bid against me. It's, it's totally disrupting or going to disrupt the foreclosure process, uh, the auction process of foreclosures out there. The reason they're doing it, um, and, and I'll get to that in a second, why they're doing it, but specifically, uh, I don't know how effective it's going to be because these cities and counties out here are all broke, um, you know, because our tax revenue is down, because uh, business revenue is down. And so I don't know as, as this will be a practical effect, but it once again is the first step in this government creep into the lives of personal and professional contracts between businesses and people and things like that. When they stand at the front of the line, they say, we get first chance to bid on that house and you have to give us the, the property if we come up with the money. That is, to me, that's another unconstitutional thing. But here's why they're doing it. In the Great Recession of 2007 to 10 or 11, something like that, California and a lot of states, in fact, all these states that had all of these 3.8 million foreclosures, most of those foreclosures sold at auction. The banks brought them to auction. Nobody, nobody bought most of them because there wasn't enough equity buyout people out there. So most of them ended up at auction. And in California in particular, three companies bought as follows. A, a, a group called Tom Barrick Group um, bought 35,000 homes in California. Tricon Residential, 30,000 homes. 
and Blackstone Group, which is a large head fund, bought 80,000 California homes. Today, in addition to those, Starwood Waypoint owns 82,000 homes in the U.S. Invitation Homes owns 40,000 homes. Rockport Group, 25,000 homes. These are giant multi-billion dollar hedge funds that own all of these house, single family houses, individual single family houses all over the country. American Residential, 52,000 homes. Silver Bay is the largest. Uh, I would think it would be American Homes for Rent, which is 52,000 homes. Silver Bay owns 200,000 single family homes in the US. You're, you're gonna see this happen next year. Mark this, this call right here, but the, the government is gonna get involved and they're already trying to do it in California. They're trying to break up these large hedge funds from going out and buying these homes and they've turned them all into rental stock. Well, there's a bigger rental demand than there is a, a demand for houses to buy, although they're both about equal right now. <clears throat> but what that's going to do, and those guys all bought all their houses at the auction, right? They sent these college kids with a Bluetooth in their ear and bags of cashier's checks to all these auctions and they just, they worked the bids and they bought home after home after home. A buddy of mine did this and his quota was he had to buy eight houses every day. Every, so 40 houses a week he had to buy. And there was three or four other guys like him running around the, uh, the area that I was in doing the exact same thing. That's what these guys were doing. They were buying up homes. They could afford to pay a higher price because they were just turning them into rental properties. And now you've got this huge chunk, 400, 500,000 homes in the US. I think it's probably close to three or four million homes that are these large corporate uh, owned homes um, that are rental properties out there. And the, the Senate bill 1079, the California passed, and I think you'll see congressional action down the road when this thing starts to slip into foreclosure, they're gonna stop these guys at the auction door. So the only play, if you guys wanna buy these kind of houses, and there's a ton of them, and keep in mind there is more equity in houses today than there was in 2007 when this whole foreclosure thing started during the Great Recession. So on the average, each house has more equity and there's more houses with more equity across the country that are gonna be in default is my belief than what happened in 2007 to 11. Um, the only place to buy those is directly from the seller before they get to auction. And the government has done us a favor by putting this forbearance agreement in place with the government loans because it is stretching out the window for foreclosures and it's going to make a nice even pile of foreclosures that can be bought for potentially years on end but you have to do it direct from the seller and you have to do it before it goes to auction because with the counties and the states and the cities bidding against you at auction to buy these houses to keep these large corporate entities from getting them it's going to be almost impossible to buy at the auction that used to be a big thing when i started in the late 90s man, you could buy at the auction, you could make a lot of money if you had cash. And that was the problem, nobody had a ton of cash then. Um, but these guys in the next recessionary period, which was this seven to 11 period, you know, these big corporate entities came in and, and uh, they took advantage of it. So um, everybody focuses on foreclosures at the auction, the money is to be made at the equity buyouts. If you guys want some information on that, Ashley will put a link here in the chat and uh, there's a little video that I did on that. And we're, like I said, we're starting a little clinic next week that's going to talk about equity buyouts in particular. And we can use that to, uh, to get you a little information and, and show you how to take advantage of that. 